Yeah, 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 yeah. When yeah. is your flight? My flight is at 2.30. Oh, yeah. But, uh, so I can, I, I, I need to leave at 1 o'clock here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, if, 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 if you all keep to your timelines, then, then it should yeah. be okay. Yeah. Turn up in the room, it <laughs> won't be that big, so we will finish very <laughs> We will finish early. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where is the next uh, magnet meeting? In Panama. In when? The, the last meeting of uh, April. I mean, the, from the, okay. it starts the, the last of April. 20th of April to 4th of April. Yeah. And this is the so the the Lachnog Lachnik meeting is in September. Yeah, but uh, yes, Lachnik Lachnog. But this time we are uh, introducing the, the technical Lachnik forum, which is a combination of three existing technical forums: okay, the Commission, Security, and Lachnik like, Six Forum, uh, together in, in a single one, with a, a single committee. So you have multiple tracks? Uh, not, we don't have tracks anymore. We will have a single central track. Uh, so those will be uh, either uh, in six security, the connection, or three things will be uh, in the same presentation. Depending on the well, let's see if I can come. Okay. And the, in the September it will be where? September it will be in Argentina. Where ah, there are two sense. possibilities. Not not the final yet, uh, whether this is Cordoba or Rosario, but not in Buenos Aires. It's very, very expensive. I know. Yeah. And uh, this, this next year, uh, we will have a lot of um, meetings in, in Buenos Aires, uh, uh, like the ONC or uh, this kind of uh, global meeting. So uh, uh, venues are crazy in their prices. So uh, we need to cover it. Yeah, Argentina is quite. Buenos Aires is quite expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. But I've never been there. No? Oh, you, should, you should take advantage of uh, the meeting down there and, and yeah. spend some spend spend some time a couple of days at least. Buenos Aires, yeah. yeah. Fernando is from Buenos Aires, yeah. right? Fernando, yeah. yeah. I need to go and visit him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good excuse. Excellent. Wow. Yeah. Let me All say right. hello to Alan. Here I did probably over 150,000 miles. Yeah. I don't think that I, I only have the short flights all uh, in Europe. With unfortunately, mostly with these crazy kettle transport airlines, the, Me the too. Ryanair. And Me too. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not using Ryanair, or, or I'm mostly using or Turkish Airlines or, or Lufthansa. But still. app that is telling me that I spent nearly 300 hours in the air this year. 
It's like, that means that you spent 600 hours in waiting in, in the airport. That's what? 30 days? I spent, I basically spent the whole month. Yeah, well, you spent, you spent one twelfth of your life. Okay, um, welcome to the IPv6 panel. Um, does this work? Yeah. My name is Jan Jorge. I work for Internet Society and I will chair this panel. So, um, in IGF 2015 and 2016, uh, there were two outputs and two um, uh, IPv6 best current practices documents. Uh, that were intended to also bring the IPv6 information to the to the um, IGF community, how to how to implement IPv6, what are the incentives to implement IPv6, and this panel is all about sort of like the feedback from uh, different I na or national or regional IGFs from around the world, how these documents basically. Um, improved the IPv6 implementation and IPv6 rate in different parts of the world. Uh, and let me let me introduce our panelists. Um, first, we have Mr. Oscar Robles. Um, he's representing the Mexico IGF. No? Well, that was written. Sorry. Uh, then we have Mr. Tsuyoshi Kinoshita-san um, from Japan. Then we have Mr. Alan Durand. Um, who is invited by China IGF. We have Mr. Eric Huizer from Netherlands and Alan, Bet Alan Barrett from um, representing Kenya IGF. Um, and I would, I would like to invite first our panelists to present um, uh, their short presentations and then we can go into, into the discussion. And we will start with Mr. Robles. Um, Oscar Robles Garay has been involved in the internet institutions in the LAC region for plus 20 years and since 2015 is the executive director of LACNIC, the RIR for Latin American countries and part of the Caribbean. Please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jan. Um, is this uh, working okay? Hopefully. Can you listen? Yeah? Can we Good. switch the presentation? You, you need to say next slide, please. Okay. So uh, I'm here um, on behalf of LACNIC, and uh, I, of course I've, I'm, I am not uh, representing IGF uh, in Mexico. Uh, I'm not part of uh, that initiative anymore. I used to be, but uh, I'm not anymore. So, uh, but I have information about the IPv6 deployment in the LACNIC uh, region, which uh, also covers uh, Mexico as well. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, what we have uh, found uh, a year ago, almost a year ago, is that we have a very low uh, IPv6 deployment in LACNIC region. Uh, it was uh, around 2% two perc two of the total traffic was um, uh, IPv6 um, uh, traffic. Um, the situation was uh, that uh, it's, uh, we were um, doing some training in the regions uh, since 2005. So uh, we train uh, more than 5,000 professionals in IPv6 in the region for uh, during those 12 years. Uh, and just in 2016, uh, there was uh, 16 training workshops on IPv6 physical uh, workshops with more than uh, uh, 1,500 participants and eight online, uh, online courses uh, on IPv6, basic and advanced, uh, with more than uh, 1,400 participants or around uh, 1,400 participants. So we were wonder, wondering what else we, we should do in order to improve the IPv6 deployment because from our point of view, we were doing all the, 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 the training that, uh, that, that was required in, in the region. Next slide, please. So um, uh, the first question was about uh, IPv6 distribution. If, uh, uh, just wondering if that could be a reason for not uh, having uh, IPv6 deployed. 
um, the LACNIC region is, uh, uh, in the LACNIC region currently, um, most of the operators have received uh, IPv6 space. Around 90% of them already have IPv6 uh, um, allocated, uh, assigned to, to them. Next, next one, please. So another thing is that uh, uh, we're looking for how ready was the region uh, to um, circulate and to, to, to transit IPv6 traffic, uh, the, the, the uh, networks of the region. And we found that um, the region was doing pretty well, uh, actually um, very well um, compared with the rest of the world. Uh, more than 33% uh, December uh, last year, uh, we had uh, uh, 33 percent, one third of the networks were already uh, enabled to transit IPv6 traffic. That's uh, <coughs> compared with the 22 percent of the rest of the world uh, in, in readiness. So out of the uh, uh, 5,500 uh, networks in the region, where um, uh, 33 percent of them were already able to uh, transit IPv6 traffic. That, that was uh, a very good number. And uh, that um, gave us the, the uh, part of the understanding of what was happening in the, in the, in the, in the region. Uh, this number, 32%, is, has grown uh, now to 37%. So it, it's still um, uh, growing. And uh, uh, that can give you an idea of uh, how ready is the region in, ter terminal in technical terms. Next slide, please. So uh, as well, we, in 2016, we uh, finished an analysis together with the um, uh, Bank for uh, Latin American Development uh, called CAF. Uh, together with them, we made this analysis on the IPv6 deployment for social and economic development in Latin America and, and the Caribbean to know the causes of the, this lack of deployment uh, in, the, in the region. And uh, th there are a lot of information there, uh, mm -hmm. if you can uh, check it out afterwards. But uh, the main reason for uh, the, the operators uh, mentioned for not deploying IPv6 was it doesn't make a business case, okay? So we, we already think that, that that was the reason, but we wanted to make sure, uh, we, we wanted to have some uh, 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 real information rather than uh, our hunch. So next slide, please. So we started in 2017 a different approach, an additional approach. We, st we are still doing uh, online training uh, uh, with the IPv6, but we started a different approach, taking with the, uh, talking with decision makers in the region, uh, basically government officials and telecom operators. Um, uh, those, uh, of course, we we shouldn't talk with them with the uh, with the technical um, uh, technical speeches, but uh, rather um, more uh, strategic and uh, 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 policy-oriented uh, discussions. Um, so the, the first message, wa message was that the, the IPv6 topic was not a technological aspect anymore, but a strategic one. Um, we shouldn't approach them in, uh, we should, we started the approach with in a non-technical uh, language. And uh, we mentioned the opportunities uh, lost and risks that they may be facing in the future if uh, the uh, IPv6 uh, uh, w w um, wasn't going to be uh, deployed. Um, uh, one piece of information, one piece of uh, information that was relevant for them is what's in it for every uh, player in every in every country. Uh, what's in it for the academy? What's in it for the operators? What's in it for the uh, u users and for the government. And everybody has a, a chance to get something, to, 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 to get some benefit uh, out of this uh, IPv6 deployment. So uh, they were very keen to know uh, that uh, uh, those benefits. And uh, we didn't start with the, uh, with the last uh, least um, IPv6 uh, um, readies, uh, readiness uh, countries, but uh, with those least developed countries. For example, Chile has 0% uh, of IPv6 deployment, but uh, we don't think that we should be talking with the uh, Chilean operators or uh, Chile uh, government representatives. They will have IPv6 deployed the, any other way in the next two or three years without any problem. The, the, those are not the ones that we are approaching, but the less developed countries like in the Caribbean and uh, Central America. So we started with, the, uh, with Guyana and Suriname, 
uh, we made these approaches, uh, talking with several people, um, uh, seven, eight uh, meetings from l um, body, leg legislators' body, bodies uh, to uh, vice president uh, in in um, in uh, what was that in Guyana. Uh, so uh, th that was a very a different approach and uh, raising the level of awareness on, on the on the relevance, the strategic relevance for the country of IPv6 deployed. Next slide, and um, last one, please. So this, uh, this is the summary of the messages that we uh, delivered to decision makers. Uh, the why was uh, uh, IPv6 needed for, um, uh, for strategic uh, reasons uh, for the country? And uh, these are the uh, five messages uh, in, in summary that we uh, provide. IPv4 and specifically a CGN uh, a, a use may prevent the capacity to map uh, uh, to a single user or a small group of possible users, making the grand prosecution a more complex task. Um, we will need to connect the 100% of the population and uh, we need to take advantage, I mean we as the country, uh, we need to take advantage uh, of uh, technologies like smart cities and the full promise of Internet of Things. And uh, both needs and re will require massive numbers of uh, IPv IP addresses, internet addresses. And IPv6 is the only sustainable solution to the previous challenges. So those, this is the, the, the basic messages uh, in a non-technical non language that we provide. And uh, we haven't, uh, we are, this is very early to, to, to know the, um, the results of these uh, conversations. But uh, this is what we are doing in 2017 and uh, uh, what we are going to, do in 2018 with a different uh, <coughs> set of countries, but still uh, think uh, we think that this is the uh, right approach at this moment after we have provided all this uh, technical training in the region. So I think that's, uh, that's all for now. Um, could the next one, please? Yeah, that's, that's it for me. Thank you. Okay, uh, Oscar, thank you very much for your nice presentation. Um, uh, our next speaker is Mr. Tsuyoshi Kinoshita-san. Um, he is the Vice President of the Internet Association Japan, covering the internet governance and IoT business development. <coughs> he served in various Japanese government technology policy de de development study groups regarding the internet policy, IPv6, IoT, green cybersecurity agenda. He is a 25 years plus ICT industry veteran. He held a variety of leadership positions in sales, marketing, and business development in Asia-Pacific region at Cisco. Please, Kinoshita-san, the floor is yours. Thank you very much <coughs> for the introduction. And uh, thank you very much for uh, I mean, having me uh, with uh, this uh, distinguished uh, panelist. I'm an uh, honor to be part of this uh, uh, session. Uh, can I have my presentation up on the screen? Uh, nevertheless, uh, as uh, Bian said, that uh, I have been personally involved in the I deployment of IPv6 almost uh, from the day one, the, the 20 years. So I have seen ups and down, <laughs> and uh, many ups and down, I should say. So uh, I am actually uh, very uh, happy to actually uh, have this opportunity to provide uh, our leader from Japan, but also a little bit the broader perspective. First of all, uh, uh, many of you uh, were attending at the IGF last year, and uh, where the, the BPF uh, document was uh, actually introduced uh, formally. And uh, the <coughs> since then, uh, the, I, I'm sure the other panelists uh, will also touch on briefly that we have seen uh, quite uh, significant progress uh, uh, being made uh, by the, some of the countries. Uh, uh, before I actually get into the, the uh, Japan perspective and the lessons learned from uh, our country, uh, I'm, the reason why I'm showing this is that I think uh, the after two decades of uh, the IPv6 uh, initiative, what uh, the uh, industry and the community has kicked off, uh, we are actually entering in, definitely entering into the, the tipping point. Actually, they are now the adoption of IPv6 is now entering into the mainstream. And a uh, few countries I have highlighted with the red color, countries like uh, India and also Uruguay and, uh, and also Brazil. Uh, uh, really um, <coughs> demonstrating how the global south 
is now the front uh, uh, runner in terms of uh, driving and adapting IPv6. Because to date, we have seen uh, many of the IPv6 discussions, adoptions are pretty much uh, around uh, developed uh, countries, the global north, if I may say so. But uh, the, in the last 12 months, uh, we are now observing that it's not about uh, the adoption uh, driven by the global north, but also now south is really taking uh, the, the front seat. And this is very much relevant to the, the next one billion, uh, the SDG agenda, that uh, we nearly are go going to expect that the, the, the uh, new internet users, it's going to really uh, be on the internet based on IPv6 uh, going forward. So now on the uh, Japan side, I should actually <laughs> talk about Japan. Next slide, slide please. So uh, in the last 12 months, uh, the, the what, uh, here's uh, the what we have uh, done um, uh, the from Japan perspective. But uh, um, um, as uh, I briefly mentioned uh, that uh, um, the, and uh, some of you know that uh, Japan has been in, on the, the, this long journey of the IPv6 deployment and adoption uh, since the day one. The, the, our community got involved heavily in the technical uh, standard development in the late 90s. And uh, we have also had the, the government <coughs> initiative to really drive the uh, adoption of IPv6 as a new uh, infrastructure for the digital age. So we have uh, really gone through the, the I mean, really uh, the, uh, um, I mean, many uh, long journey over the last uh, uh, 20 years. And uh, the, 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 I, I would also like to actually emphasize, it's not only for us in Japan, but uh, we are fully committed uh, to the global community and also the region. Uh, uh, so that uh, we are pretty much uh, 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 enjoying uh, the uh, pract best practice sharing, not only within the nation, but also the outside uh, the country to date. So uh, to be specific on the, what has happened in the last 12 months, uh, notably uh, the, we have uh, ha had a, a couple of significant uh, the update in terms of the, how the, uh, the um, um, the IPv6 uh, uh, getting uh, uh, further adapted to uh, adoption of IPv6 got accelerated. The, the one uh, most uh, uh, importantly uh, to uh, highlight here is a mobile operator. The, our IPv6 initiative to date uh, has been pretty much centered around the wireline infrastructure, uh, uh, ISP and the backbone providers and the, the wireline uh, the operators, uh, the infrastructure. But now in the last uh, six months, I would say, uh, this year in uh, 2017, we were very happy to see that all the mobile operators, three mo major mobile operators we have in Japan, NTT Docomo, SoftBank, AU, stepped up. And uh, now they have uh, put IPv6 as a default uh, 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 IP services uh, on the, uh, the uh, mobile infrastructure. So we think that uh, the, uh, we are on the right uh, uh, course of action in terms of uh, uh, really uh, uh, ad driving adoption of IPv6 uh, throughout uh, the, all the infrastructures involved. Uh, but uh, with uh, the new uh, uh, initiative seen from a mobile operator, we think the adoption rate will uh, really go to uh, pick up in the next coming uh, few years. Uh, and uh, so that's one. Uh, the other stuff uh, we also like to call it out is uh, content providers. We are finally also seeing not only the infrastructure players, but also content players are uh, getting pressure because of the movement from uh, big giants si such as uh, the uh, Google and Facebook and so on, who really made uh, IPv6 stand on. Local content provider are now also seeing that they all, uh, now need to move uh, in terms of uh, uh, getting IPv6 ready. So this is uh, another positive sign we have seen in the last uh, 12 months since uh, the IPv6, uh, the BPF uh, uh, I mean update got introduced uh, uh, last December uh, in Mexico. And uh, that's pretty much it. So let me move on to the next uh, slide. So one of the, the things that uh, we may uh, also share why the Japan has been the front runner in terms of uh, driving, adapting IPv6, there are two uh, uh, secret success, if I may say so. 
uh, uh, which uh, I'd like to share. One is uh, that we have very strong tech community. So we, uh, we have, uh, uh, we're very fortunate that uh, before uh, uh, facing a need of a capacity building to deal with a new technology adoption, we have uh, had uh, those very strong tech community uh, uh, really uh, uh, staying on top of uh, the, the IPv6. <coughs> That's one. But uh, more, uh, most, more importantly, I think uh, that other countries or regions uh, could also uh, somewhat uh, have a look at uh, the best practice from Japan is uh, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the fact that we do have uh, the IPv6 study group uh, uh, framework installed uh, uh, by the, the government initiative where not only the government is uh, facilitating the meetings, but uh, the, uh, uh, the academia and the, the, uh, all the private sector and the, uh, sometimes uh, the, the, the um, citizens as a stakeholder were invited in this uh, study group meetings. And uh, we, what we do is basically uh, as a collective group of the, the IPv6 concerned stakeholders, we basically review which part is actually uh, really making progress and which a part of the critical infrastructure or the services have to take uh, the action to really drive the uh, nationwide adoption. We have had uh, 37 meetings since this meeting got installed uh, back in 2009, and there are uh, four uh, official reports uh, published uh, with uh, two interim progress reports. And uh, the, the, what we do is basically calling out what, what are the, the current sta na st nature of uh, IPv6 uh, adoption, but also uh, encouraging, sometimes reinforcing a necessary action to the concerned stakeholders, what uh, needs to be done. The, uh, the, I, the mobile operator's uh, IPv6 default uh, uh, standard service rollout began in the middle of this year is indeed uh, the result of this uh, study group's recommendation. So we have a mechanism to really uh, calling out uh, uh, and along with uh, recommended actions to the concerned parties to uh, ensure that uh, they will uh, execute on the expected actions accordingly. And uh, we do the check and the balance type of a mechanism uh, under this uh, IPv6 study group. So this is, uh, uh, I would say, uh, the biggest reasons why Japan has been uh, has not been lost interest or motivation in terms of driving IPv6 since uh, the, uh, the I mean, late 90s. Can I go to the next slide? So another, another uh, interesting one, well, the best practices uh, I would also like to call it out is uh, how the government is uh, actually taking uh, their role model in terms of uh, driving and adapting IPv6. This chart may be a little bit uh, hard to uh, see on the screen, but uh, this is uh, actually uh, the adoption rate uh, 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 observed in the last, uh, I mean, five plus years from the government agencies, how the government agencies' uh, website uh, getting IPv6 ready and DNS ready and also mail uh, uh, system is ready. And uh, th we are very uh, happy to see that, uh, the, uh, for example, the website of the central government agencies are now about 50% IPv6 ready, uh, while the industry, uh, the website, uh, about 20 plus percentage. Of course, size of the install base are quite uh, different. But uh, the government is actually demonstrating that it's not only uh, the infrastructure uh, uh, to be ad uh, worked out in terms of IPv6 adoption, but content side have to be also uh, uh, getting ready. So that uh, we are very uh, actually happy to see that uh, this kind of uh, the, the, the demonstration is helping uh, out the outside the government uh, to be aware of the, the necessity of IPv6 ready. So maybe the next one is my last slide. So uh, the, my last uh, uh, message, uh, the message is that uh, uh, we, as I said earlier, that uh, we are really uh, coming into the mainstream of IPv6 adoption, not only from Japan's perspective I'm making this statement, but uh, uh, the, um, uh, actually the timing of the, uh, this, the mainstream adoption uh, is somewhat uh, viewed as a perfect storm mean that uh, the, the, the new emerging countries require the IPv6 based infrastructure built out, uh, but uh, they, uh, uh, which definitely are going to be based on IPv6. But uh, the reason why I said so is that we finally, after the 20 years of uh, the, uh, the dream 
we finally have uh, the killer application for IPv6, which is the uh, Internet of Things. That in addition to the human as a user of the Internet, we do actually going to see the new users, like uh, Things, uh, going to require new IP address. So that uh, we do <coughs> see that uh, the adoption uh, uh, now taking uh, um, uh, off now is uh, really uh, uh, the best uh, uh, timing from uh, the variety of perspective. That said, uh, that uh, the, the work has not done yet. Uh, that we need to continuously uh, work together to uh, really make the, the internet uh, 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 shifting from the legacy V4 based uh, infrastructure to the modern uh, V6 based uh, the, uh, network or the uh, system. So I would uh, expect that uh, the, we're gonna continue to have this kind of forum at the upcoming uh, IGF uh, 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 in the years. And uh, that's uh, pretty much uh, what I wanted to say for now. Thank you. Thank you, Kinoshita-san. Uh, very nice to hear from Japan and, and IPv6 uh, progression from your side. Um, so now we have Mr. Eric Huizer from Netherlands. Um, let's see what's happening in Netherlands. So Eric Huizer is a CEO at Geant, the European Network for Research and Education. Eric is also chair of the Netherlands IPv6 Task Force. He has been active in the internet technology and governance space since 1985. He is an inductee in the Internet Hall of Fame. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Can we? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Jan. Uh, I'd like to share a couple of lessons learned uh, with you uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, I uh, have left out most of the things that you've heard from the previous speakers. We have, I can confirm their uh, lessons learned because they are similar and we have uh, taken similar measures. So I try to go a little bit beyond uh, that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, first of all, IPv6 is not necessary in the current internet, of course. We can easily do with a two-bit address space uh, for the, everybody is only going to Google and Facebook anyway. Next slide, uh, please. So uh, uh, before I start on the lessons learned, um, there's, it, it's just incredible, and I think the other speakers here at the table must have had that too, how many peop non-technical people come up to me on IPv6 and try to tell me what the right solution would be, you know? And they have no technical clue whatsoever. And they, and they come up to me and they tell me uh, how, you know, how you can fix IPv6 or IPv4 for all that matter. And, um, and, and usually a lot of criticism is about the migration and the, or the lack of migration and, and et cetera. So I'd like to show this, this slide by Jeff Houston because I think this depicts the original plan. And the original plan uh, I'd like to point out was made in 1995, right? So uh, that is quite a bit of time ago. And the idea was that we would start to deploy IPv6, which is the red line, and uh, the internet would grow along the green line, and the IPv6, uh, IPv4 pool would deplete along the blue line, and that we would have enough IPv4 addresses to complete the full migration to IPv6. Well, of course, a lot of things happened. First of all, the green line went berserk and almost went vertically through the roof. Uh, the red line uh, stayed almost horizontal, and so the two are not yet meeting, and we have depleted our IPv4 pool. Next slide, please. <coughs> so, this is what I want to talk to you, to you about. That IPv6 is like an emergency exit. It lacks a deadline. It's costly if you waited too long. It suffers from myths. Uh, it's not, it doesn't need just naming, but it needs shaming to force people to implement it. And dual stack, dual stack, dual stack, or you run into problems. Next slide, please. So why is IPv6 like an emergency exit? Well, it's like an emergency exit because if you talk to somebody who operates a restaurant or a cafe or a discotheque and you tell them you have to implement an emergency exit, they are really not very happy. They know they have to do it. 
They know it's unavoidable, but it won't get them any extra customers. There's no business case for the emergency exit. And the same goes for IPv6. You know you have to do it, but you also know that it won't attract any extra people. Well, at least not in the short run. Next slide, please. And the problem with IPv6 is it lacks a nice deadline. I wish it had a deadline like the year 2000 problem, because then everybody would really get nervous. And what you see now is that it gets onto the priority list of larger companies, ISPs, etc. But then other issues come up, and the priority is never high enough for IPv6, so it always drops to the bottom because there is no deadline, and you can always postpone implementing IPv6. And one of the really frustrating issues we had in the Netherlands is that our main ISP, which is uh, Vodafone Zigo, uh, has been changing ownership multiple times over the last 10 years. And every time it changes ownership, the new owners want to clean out the whole priority list, and of course IPv6 drops back to the bottom. Next slide, please. The rumor has it that IPv6 is very costly, and I recently was involved with an organization, and it was really costly, but they were forced to go to IPv6 because they really needed addresses, and they ran out of IPv4, and there was no way they could get more. So they had to do almost an instant transition to IPv6, and yes, that is very costly. However, I will show you at the end an example of a well-prepared IPv6 migration, people who planned well ahead, an organization that planned well ahead, and just replaced all the equipment when it needed replacing, and then made sure that the new equipment supported IPv6. They gradually inc uh, introduced all the, uh, all the security stuff around IPv6. They trained the people. They did it well-prepared, and then the cost retained to a minimum. So don't wait too long. And if you're only starting now, you've waited too long. Next slide, please. IPv6 suffers a lot from myths. So you come in with well, f somebody from the Dutch IPv6 task force comes in, explains to people what they have to do. People go off, they Google, and they come up with a lot of myths. And one of, uh, one of those myths is, I have IPv4 addresses, so I don't need IPv6. Which is, of course, a really stupid way of reasoning. It's like, I, I am on the old internet, and I don't care if anybody is on the new internet, and I can't communicate with anybody on the new internet. I'm on the old internet, I stick to the old internet. Or, we don't need IPv6, because NET is doing fantastic. Or, even worse, NAT is our main security feature, and IPv6, we don't need to do NAT, so we lose our security feature. If your security feature is dependent on NAT, you have a bigger problem than just IPv6. If you really think NAT is a great tool, you also have a bigger problem than IPv6. IPv6 is like the year 2K problem. It doesn't exist. Well, wake up, it does. IPv6 is complicated. Well, just as complicated as IPv4, and you have to calculate in 128 bits, but yeah, rest assured, it takes one hour to learn how to deal with 128 bits. IPv6 is slower than IPv4. That's a really nice one. Yes, it takes a, probably a, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a millisecond longer to transport 128 bits uh, compared to 32 bits, so maybe it's slower, but I don't think you will notice. Dual stack means double the amount of work. No, it doesn't. There's no other argument there. Uh, it's better to wait until everybody else is already deploying IPv6. This is coming from the same people that never installed the newest version of iOS. They wait until that version has, you know, already in, been in existence for two years before they uh, deploy that, and in the meantime, they have a lot of bugs and make them vulnerable to security. Next slide, please. So, we first tried affirmative action. 
So we tried to promote IPv6. We, we put everybody in the spotlight who did wonderful on IPv6. Uh, we worked uh, with our government, and this statement, by the way, is not even of my government. This statement that you see there is from the European Union, and it's coming from uh, Commissioner Cruz at the time. Um, and, and all the affirmative action from, from the government, from the IPv6 task force, it didn't work. It's not enough. So what we did is we built internet.nl. And um, I don't know if, if you have uh, online access, but then please click on the internet.nl. Um, uh, it's um, internet.nl is a, a website that allows you to, uh, to test your domain. So uh, you can either test the connection on the right uh, uh, let's do that, S do start test on the right. Uh, or you can test your website or your email address, and it will test it for all the modern, up-to-date internet standards. So it will tell you if you have, have IPv6 connectivity, which we don't in this case. It will tell you uh, whether, we, uh, whether you have uh, DNS SEC. Uh, it will tell you whether your DNS is rightly configured, etc., etc. And it will also shame you if you don't have those things implemented. This tool, all green, <laughs> all green. I wouldn't expect anything else from you, uh, Jan. <laughs> um, this tool is not uh, just uh, only uh, uh, usable in the Netherlands. You can use this all through the world. And I, I, I encourage you to use that tool and to show organizations where they are failing uh, in implementing uh, their stuff. Uh, I recently started at JR, and even if I fill in my own JR.org name, uh, I still see that I have work to do there. Um, but this helps. This is a really great tool, and this has helped in the Netherlands to, to, to promote stuff a lot uh, better. And uh, back to the slides, please. And next slide. Um, many of the ISPs are now ready and deploying IPv6. That is not to say that all the citizens in the Netherlands have already got an IPv6, and we are not very high yet on Google's uh, ranking for IPv6, but our major ISPs are now IPv6 prepared. That means that every new customer that gets connected gets IPv6. The old customers get IPv6 as soon as they replace their modems, because replacing the modems is, a, is an expensive uh, thing. However, several ISPs are using DS Lite. And the problem with DS Lite, dual stack Lite, is of course that it gives a lot of problems, because you, you get NAT at your home address, uh, plus another NAT at, uh, at the carrier level which makes two nets, and one net is problem enough. Two nets on top of each other is way more problem than most people can handle. And unfortunately, you get the DS Lite as soon as you do IPv6. So people associate the problems with IPv6, and people start complaining that IPv6 is not working. While IPv6 is working perfectly, it's IPv4 that sucks because you got DS Lite. So try to avoid DS Lite, do the whole dual stack. Next slide, please. So I, s I finish with uh, a very positive example. Uh, this is an article in Dutch, unfortunately, but this is uh, from Avance University for Applied Sciences. Uh, they, they came up with a good plan. They implemented it. Uh, they looked at the cost. The costs weren't too high. And uh, all in all, they said the whole trajectory to implement IPv6 was really smooth and easy. And uh, I hope this article gets translated because it's really positive on that it's not that much effort if you just prepare yourself well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, and thank you for this tool. I think internet.nl website is, is very, very useful to do, to do some uh, testing. All right. Uh, we are on how we're doing with time. I think we're doing quite well. Um, our next speaker is Alan Duran.
uh, from ICANN. He's a principal technologist at ICANN office of the CTO. IPv6 pioneer since 1993. Original IPv6 architect for Comcast uh, in US in 2005 to 2008 and chair of several IPv6 related working groups at the ITF and author of many IPv6 related RFCs. He is looking at the global deployment of IPv6 and the evolution of the IPv4 market. So please, Alan, tell us a little bit more about the global uh, picture. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jan. Uh, so as you mentioned, I've been working on IPv6 since uh, early 1993, and since then, everybody has asked me, when are we going to see IPv6? And the answer has been, well, in two years. So it has been now 24, 25 years. Uh, hopefully it's going to be soon in two years now. <laughs> so, but are we there yet? That's really the question that uh, I went on to, to try to answer. So I did some work with uh, Jeff Houston from APNIC, and uh, we're collecting a lot of measurements. Uh, Jeff is collecting about six to 10 million measurements a day all around the world uh, through the Google Ads system. So he's targeting users, and presenting users with an IPv6 address and an IPv4 address and try to see if users can reach both or just one or the other. And uh, uh, what's interesting with the system is it gives the user perspective. Can actually people use this thing? Uh, if things have been done upstream, like service provider have done some work, uh, but they have not turned it on or not make it available, then it doesn't make any difference to the users. So that's really a user-centric perspective. The flip side of the story being a user-centric perspective is it does not capture machine-to-machine -machine communication. Anything that is IoT is not captured in those statistics. So next slide, please. So when we look at IPv6, we can do two things. We can look at the ratio of IPv6 over the population, and that gives the, the uh, penetration of IPv6 in the country. Oops. Or we can look at the ratio of IPv6 over IPv4 and see uh, how many of the users have actually <coughs> migrated to IPv6. It's a slightly different picture. So I've done both in this study. So let's look at the first one. So it's looking for all the, or most of the countries. So the first question is, how do you define a country? And it's not actually a very easy question to answer. So I came up with my own definition. I took all the countries that have a country code, a two-letter country code, that has a population that is larger than one million. Uh, why do I do that? Is because the statistics that we use about populations are, um, well, the data is not very clean. And uh, the smaller the country, the less reliable the information about population is. So if we take countries that have at least a million people in there, we have a higher likelihood to have better data. Um, so, I ranked this by total IPv6 uh, adoption in 2017, end of 2017. The data is from yesterday. Uh, so, what we see is that there are countries that have been accelerating in IPv6 in the last four years. So, the study goes back from 2014 up to now. And we have some countries that have not been so active. So, essentially, cluster of them into uh, three categories. The countries that have more than 5%, we can say, yeah, this is happening. The countries that are between one and five, so they're just starting to bubble up on the radar, and countries that are below 1%. So in this view, we have uh, 158, uh, yeah, 158 countries. 103 are still below the radar. They are still below 1%. And that is worrisome. The other side is we have 31 countries that are above 5%. And if you look at them year after year after year, those are the same countries that have been increasing the IPv6 penetration. So this starts to paint a picture where the left-hand side of this graph, those 31 countries, are actively doing this, and in a few years, they will be on course to get to full IPv6 deployment. But on the right-hand side, not so much. So uh, are we going to go in a world where we have two internets, a 31-country internet and a 
and the rest? And uh, that's a question that uh, I'm asking. So next slide, please. I've done exactly the same calculation now using the ratio of V6 over V4. And it's slightly more uh, optimistic. Now we have 37 countries that show up really on the radar of us 5%. Um, but the overall picture is the same. We still have a, more than 100 countries that don't show up on the radar at all. So it's interesting to look at those top 37 countries. So next slide. And I'm going to go straight into uh, the, ne the following one. Next one, please. Yeah, so this, I have both data for population of IPv4. So if you look at this one, what we see is, well, the first thing that strikes me is there's some negative. So there are places where we see a decrease of IPv6. So I'm still studying this to try to figure out, is it a glitch because the, some of the data we have is uh, still dirty and we need to clean it up a little bit more? Or is there really a decrease? So sometimes a decrease could be an increase in disguise. For example, if we, call it, if we compute the ratio of IPv6 over IPv4 and your IPv6 stay the same, but your IPv4 increase, the ratio is going to decrease, right? So uh, I don't necessarily want to look at this as people stop doing V6 and remove IPv6. It's not necessarily that the case. We need to be somewhat careful with that. Uh, so putting aside those decrease that may or may not be a real decrease, what is interesting to me is to see what is happening year over year. Are we doing better each year or not? So if you look at some countries like India, for example, the second one in there, they really started in 2016 and 2017, it just exploded. If you look at countries like Belgium uh, next to it, well, Belgium has started earlier, so 2014 include things that were done earlier. But they are now reaching about seven, 60, 70%, and they are already in the phase of the curve where things are not accelerating as much. <coughs> They're starting to somewhat flatten and plateau. But there are some countries like, let's say, Peru, uh, where we see a lot in 14, a lot in 15, and then not so much. So in my next part of research, my next phase of, of this research, I want to go in this list of 37 countries and really understand what is the landscape there. Are those wireline providers or wireless providers that are driving this? Are they motivated by um, what government mandate may have been there or not? Why is it that uh, we, we reach this plateau in some cases. Is it that only one of the maybe four providers in the country did that and the other three or four uh, did not do it? And um, what was the motivation behind this? Um, next slide. So this is the same thing looking at the, the one to five percent. And uh, uh, same observation, we see some countries that did a little bit last year or some countries that did a little bit a year or two years or three years ago, but haven't really done much since. So um, I would just like to go back maybe to the, to the uh, one, one back, one back. Thank you. So I want to conclude on this. Um, the optimist part of me is looking at the left side of the graph and says that there are countries that are really, really look, looking good and on great course. Uh, not so optimistic side of me is looking at uh, a new divide, and I don't like that. Uh, and hopefully when I will do this graph again in uh, a year or six months from now, uh, the red will go further to the right and will be less and less countries that are not showing up. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, this was quite a nice global overview of what of what's going on and yeah we we all want that red line to be as further right as possible all right alan mr alan barrett from africa um alan barrett is the ceo of afrinic so at this panel we have two ceos of two rirs this is this is quite this is quite cool um that's the regional internet registry for africa He's been involved with technical and policy aspects of the internet since the early 90s. Please, Alan, the floor is yours. Mm. Okay, I, uh, thank you. So I, I'm here in, in my role as um, representing Afrinic, 
Um, on the agenda, you'll see that it's the Kenya IGF, and that that's not really the case. Um, the, the speaker from Kenya wasn't able to come, so basically I'm filling in for him. Um, so um, I see my slides up there. Okay, next slide, please. Um, Afrinic, um, sorry, Africa um, has a fairly low internet penetration rate, and um, a lot of use of, of IPv4 with network address translation so that um, multiple users share the same IP address and um, also very low IPv6 penetration. So I, I hope that we can improve that. Um, Africa's population is growing a lot faster than the population of most of the rest of the world. The <clears throat> graph on the right there, you probably can't read the legend, but the, the green line at the top is the world population of Asia shows that it w it's projected to increase from now until about 2055 and then maybe it will start reducing or stay more or less the same. Um, the flat lines near the bottom are um, Europe, North America, Latin America, the Caribbean and Oceania showing that their population is projected to stay fairly stable um, over the next 50 years. Um, from now until maybe the, the end of the century. Um, whereas the purple line going up there is the population of Africa, projected to increase from uh, about 1.2 billion now uh, to possibly more than 4 billion by the end of the century. Um, now, of course, these are just projections. They could change. Uh, nobody knows exactly what the population is going to be. but. Um, it, it is interesting that, that Africa's population is growing so fast, and that will bring an increased demand. And so th there's a lot of business opportunity there. Um, businesses providing internet access can uh, take advantage of the increased demand from population growth uh, to increase their business. <coughs> now, currently, the internet penetration in Africa is, <coughs> excuse me, about uh, 31%. And um, that's definitely growing, and possibly in the next three years it might increase to more than 50%. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we are, of course, like the rest of the world, running out of IPv4 addresses in Africa. So this graph shows the there's one point per year from 2012 to 2016 showing how from 2012 uh, the amount of available IPv4 space in the AFRINIC pool, so what AFRINIC had available to allocate to our members throughout Africa, has decreased from about 4 slash 8s in 2012 to about 1.5 slash 8s at the end of 2016. And then on the next slide, um, we zoom in a bit. Oh. No, we don't. We just add one point to 2017. Um, now, in early 2017, we um, crossed that line of having less than one slash eight available. And uh, when that happened, the <clears throat> what we call the soft landing policy took effect. And... Um, under the terms of the soft landing policy, um, AFRINIC members, who are mostly ISPs, uh, have to try harder to qualify for additional allocations of IPv4 space. Um, and we expect that we'll cross another boundary of having uh, less than one quarter, less than 0.25 slash 8s available sometime next year. And when that happens, um, the rules will change again, and um, AFRINIC members, the, mostly the ISPs or, or possibly end-user organizations in Africa, will only be able to get us 1 slash 22, that is uh, about 1,000 IPv4 addresses at a time. Now, on the next slide, um, so we, we're rapidly running out of IPv4 space, but we've got plenty of IPv6 space. <coughs> um, more than 40% of the AFRINIC members have some IPv6 space allocated. And um, 
they can easily come to Afrinic, th those who don't can easily come to Afrinic and request IPv6 space. It's very easy. The, the amount of justification that they need to, to receive, say, a slash 32 of IPv6 space from Afrinic is minimal. And uh, there's also no extra charge for that. Um, we, the, the annual membership fee for, for a member who has some IPv4 space and some IPv6 space will basically be the same as for the same member if they didn't have any IPv6. So there shouldn't be a financial barrier um, to receiving IPv6 space from Afrinet. Nevertheless, we see that only 41% of our members have IPv6 space, and only half of those um, only about 18% of the networks in Africa, which is, let's say, about half of the 41%, um, are announcing their IPv6 space um, in the BGP routing table. Um, and of those, very few of them are actually using it. So the, the situation in Africa looks um, like much lower deployment than in the rest of the world. Um, we've just seen in Ale Durant's presentation that there, there are many countries with IPv6 uh, usage of 30% uh, or 40%, whereas in Africa, um, the highest is less than 10%. Um, so this, this graphic, you can hardly see it there, but most of Africa is shaded white, which means very little IPv6 usage. Um, Zimbabwe is the only one that looks a little bit green there, and um, <clears throat> it has IPv6 usage of between 7% and 9%, depending on whose measurements you believe. Um, and that's the leader in Africa. Um, the, in second place, we have Egypt, with somewhere between 0.5 and 0.4 um, IPv6 penetration. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this this diagram shows the, the the darkness of the green shading shows the ratio of um, IPv6 prefixes that are rooted in BGP versus IPv6 prefixes that are allocated. So um, the leader there is Mauritius. That'll be a tiny little dot in the Indian Ocean uh, where 68% of the IPv6 prefixes that the providers have received from Afrinic are actually announced in BGP. Um, Tanzania, the green blob in the middle of the East Coast, um, is a little bit behind at 56%. And um, Zimbabwe, which showed as the best in the previous diagram, um, is only 42% here. And the reason for that is um, there are many internet service providers in Zimbabwe, and uh, one of the big ones turned on IPv6, and that pushed the country's IPv6 usage up. Uh, but many others have not turned on IPv6, and so that puts the ratio of um, rooted space versus allocated space, um, it, it reduces that ratio down to 42%. Um, you, you see a few more green countries here in this diagram, but there's a lot of white or, or very dim green. And those are countries where um, either there's no IPv6 at all or uh, the IPv6 has been allocated to the ISPs by the registry but is not being used, not being announced in BGP. Uh, next slide. Um, there, there are some good news cases, however. Uh, here is um, South Africa. The black line shows the number of allocated IPv6 prefixes. And you can see it goes, it goes over about a, a three, year, three or four year period from the middle of 2012 on the left-hand side of the graph to uh, about the third quarter of 2017 on the right-hand side of the graph. And so uh, the units on the... the y-axis are in number of prefixes, which closely corresponds to number of internet service providers, because uh, typically they, they only need one prefix each. The IPv6 prefix is enough to serve their needs 
uh, unlike v4 where you would need many ipv4 prefixes uh, so we see that that over the last four years or so uh, the number of ipv6 prefixes in south africa has increased from about 85 to more than 200 that's definitely good news that's the black line um, the green line near the bottom doesn't look so good though that's the prefixes that are actually alive where we can we can see some some actual usage coming from those prefixes they're not just allocated sitting on the shelf somewhere um, but they're actually being used and there we we see uh, sure it's increased over the last four years from oh, from 10 to 20 or 25 but that's still not looking very good there's room for much more improvement uh, on the next slide um, this is Zimbabwe <clears throat> and we're looking at the top 500 websites in Zimbabwe and um, oh dear so the bad news is that only 100 of the top 500 websites in Zimbabwe um, are IPv6 enabled that's that's bad news I guess if it's only 100 out of 500 but if you look at that green line um, to y a year ago it, it's say in the middle of 2016 uh, it was only 50 so over the past year or the, let's say the past 18 months the number of v6 enabled websites in Zimbabwe shown by the the green line has increased from 50 to, a, to more than 100 so there's some progress there but I wish it was faster uh, on the next slide, we see the same kind of data for Egypt, a more rapid increase. So again, we have a, about an 18-month period. Oh, sorry, no, this one, the x-axis is longer. It's about a, uh, a four-year period. Um, and we show the top 500 websites in Egypt, and now about 150 of them are IPv6 enabled. And there was a big jump earlier this year when it, when it increased from 100 to 150. Uh, I'm not sure of the re reason for that. Why did they all suddenly enable v6 all at once? Um, it could be something as simple as one of the ISPs turned on v6 and automatically all the web servers behind that ISP were able to use v6. Uh, on the next slide, um, <coughs> this is the results of a survey that we did. <clears throat> um, Afrinex surveyed network operators in Africa asking them do you have IPv6 um, or maybe it's maybe you're working towards it it's in progress but it's not done yet uh, maybe you're only planning it and um, we did this for several different types of networks data centers uh, university campuses enterprises um, internet service providers and uh, the last category is just other or unspecified uh, so um, we see here uh, if you can interpret all the, the different colors that 34.5 percent of the internet service provider networks are at least doing uh, sorry no I got that wrong about 34.5 percent of the networks that we surveyed were from internet service providers um, about 11.9% per, 11 .9 of the net networks that responded to the survey were enterprises. About 14% of the networks that responded to the survey were campus networks. And about 5.7% were data centers. Now, and, and the last 33% were other. Now, within each of those categories, um, we've broken out the results using shading. So if we look at, let's say, the orange ones at the bottom, okay, 34.5% of the networks that we surveyed were service providers. And looking at the shading, um, of those, about 40% of them say they've, they've done their IPv6, it, it's done. Um, another 10% or so says it's in progress, and looks like another 40% says we're thinking about it we're planning and finally another 10 percent say they're testing so um, th there is some progress there uh, at least people are thinking about it or planning
but the deployment is a lot lower than I would hope. Okay, um, now the same survey, <coughs> we asked people, what are the challenges? Why, why don't you have IPv6? And um, the answers we get when we ask managers are different from the answers we get when we ask engineers. Um, when we ask managers, um, nearly 20% of them says we lack confidence that, that we can handle IPv6. Whereas for the engineers, only 13.5% said that. Um, a lot of the engineers looking near the bottom, there's the second red line from the bottom there, 16.4% 16 of the engineers said, our management doesn't really support us in deploying IPv6. Whereas only 6% of the managers said, our management doesn't support IPv6. Um, a lot of them said it's not a priority on both sides. About 11 point something percent of engineers and 11.4 percent of managers said the biggest reason why we are not deploying IPv6 is it's not a priority. Um, but also a lot of them are saying that knowledge and skill is the biggest reason why they're not deploying. <clears throat> nearly 18 percent of managers and uh, nearly 16% of engineers say our knowledge and skill is holding us back. That's the biggest reason why we're not deploying IPv6. So, next slide. What is Afrinic doing about it? We have a training team that travels all over Africa giving training on IPv6. And uh, this year, 2017, uh, we've taught 20 workshops in 18 countries. And we've trained more than 600 engineers. But that's not enough. Um, we need those engineers to go off and use their training and deploy IPv6. Um, we've also set up a certification platform called CERTI6, um, where we, we're offering exams. You can, you can pass an online course and receive a certificate, which is accredited by the World IPv6 Forum. And we've signed up some partners to help us um, administer the exams, but... Um, it hasn't really taken off yet. Okay, uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, that was a nice overview. So I would now like to open the floor <coughs> if there are any questions. Mr. Alan Aina, please. Yes. Um, hello. Okay, this is Alan Aina from, from Africa. So I would first <laughs> direct my question to Alan. Alan, um, uh, from the survey, say that um, the engineers are complaining about not getting enough support from the um, the managers. But you are saying that you will be t training um, engineers, so maybe it's time to also train train the managers. So. Oops. Is this something Afrinic is planning to do um, in the short term? So this is my first question. The second question goes to Jean, but I think he left the room. I don't know, but maybe the other panelists can also help me. If I got him very, uh, <coughs> correctly, he, he said, uh, don't deploy your IPv6 with DS Lite. Okay, so I don't know if I, I got the thing very well. If we don't do DS Lite, so what is the alternative he's, he's, yeah, he's proposing? Yeah, uh, um, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Huizer has to leave for the airport to catch to catch the the, the flight. Would like would anyone like? We we have basically the author of the slide, Mr. Alan Duran. <laughs> so maybe he can answer. <laughs> okay. Um. Let me quickly answer the the question about training. Um. Yes, we're using the survey to help us figure out what we should do next. And um, so as a result of the survey, we will be designing um, training courses for managers. It's, it's not yet operational, but we, we will do it because the survey tells us it's needed. So about DS Lite, something that we did about 10 years ago. And, and the idea is if you have to do IPv4 and IPv6, you're essentially doing more work and you're not really getting a lot of benefits because you still have to do IPv4, right? So that seemed to be an interesting interim solution when we still have <laughs> IPv4 addresses. 
But when you don't have IPv4 addresses left, or you have very few left, not enough, then you cannot do that anymore, right? So, and in that case, it's kind of an exit strategy again. You need to do something. And as you have seen all the data about v6 deployment, we are very far from a situation where we can say, oh, just do IPv6 only and nothing else. That's not a, a viable approach for most providers or, or most services. So you need to do something. And when you are essentially pushing a corner like this, when you have to do something and the rest of the world doesn't really help you, well, you are not going to be able to offer a service that is 100% as good as before. And that's really the, what the situation is. So it's not so much that there are two NATs, actually there's only one NAT in, in the system, but there is a larger NAT where you share your addresses with uh, other people. And uh, sometimes it creates problems. And that's kind of expected because you are painted in a corner where you don't have enough IPv4 addresses and the world has not moved yet to IPv6. Okay, sorry. If I may add, um, um, there are several mechanisms available, um, not just DS Lite as the, as the IPv4 um, uh, transport. You have for, for mobile networks, the, the, the majority of mobile networks is uh, deciding on IPv6 only, plus uh, 464 XLAT, that is basically the NET64 translation. Um, and the, the, the landline providers are also, there's also another mechanism called um, um, A plus P, and you have uh, MAP E and MAP T as a stateless uh, version of, of, of how to share the address and port. So you have variety of, of tools in the toolbox that you can use today um, uh, to do this. But we need, we need to understand that the biggest problem is that you need to change the CPE. With DS Lite, with A plus P, you need to change the, the, the CPE and implement the new functionality. So you need to carefully, to carefully plan and choose which, which way you, you want to go. Would like would anyone from the I would like to respond to this ad? quickly. Yeah. Uh, yes, you have many mechanisms, and it's partially my fault uh, because I was chairing some of the IETF working group that designed those mechanisms. And and when we started in the late 90s, it was let a thousand flower bloom and we'll see what happened. Uh, now we have many mechanisms, and unfortunately, we have created more confusion than anything else. Uh, and that's uh, not necessarily the best place to be. But at the end of the day, all those mechanisms are variation of one from the other. They are small deltas. In the end, when there's not enough IPv4 addresses, you have to share. And when you share, yeah, you're not the only owner, so things can happen. Most of the properties we heard about uh, CGN are creating problems for uh, law enforcement, etc. This situation exists regardless of how you share addresses, being from a DS Lite, being from an A plus P, being from a NAT64, all of them have exactly the same problem. You are sharing something. You are not the sole owner of that thing. Okay, would anyone else like to add? Okay, thank you. Just uh, <coughs> one comment uh, to add on to the comment I just heard. So, Having a look at uh, the contents of the IPv6 PPF uh, the published last year, uh, it is uh, actually not clear which uh, technologies are good for the brownfield transition, which ones are good for the, the greenfield the deployment. So I would suggest that uh, if there is an opportunity to update the BPF uh, <laughs> in the future, we should uh, actually incorporate uh, some of the best practices uh, based upon the situation, what uh, the need of IPv6 adaptions uh, the people are facing with. Thank you. Um, okay. We have an online question. Hello, everybody. I'm Luka Dacic from Webster University, your online host. And we have a question and comment from Mr. Izumi Okutani. And the question goes, 
This is Izumi Okutani as an individual community member of the community in Japan. Interesting fact observation by Alan Duran on the division of IPv6 deployment. I had the chance to talk on local content service and cloud providers in Japan, and they listed a few challenges and possible ways forward. I wonder whether they could help in addressing some of the div divides on IPv6. Number one, access lines are IPv6 ready technically, but still bugs in middleware. If more information on debugging can be shared, it, it helps. Question two, uh, in addition to the uh, announcement by the IAB, if open source makes IPv6 as default, it could have substantial impact. Part number three, cost and time on training for help desk is often more, more challenged in terms of commercial service than technical issues on deploying IPv6. Is there a common help desk Q&A slash trainings are available? It could help very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Who would like to take the first two questions, I might take the third one. I, I might take the first one, and, but spin it slightly differently. Uh, there's always the chicken and egg problem that we have heard for 20 years. Oh, we had no users, so we have no reason to put any services, and there are no services, so there's no reason to put users. Uh, and that has been essentially solved when uh, Google, Facebook, and a few others went on to deploy IPv6 and all of a sudden there was content. What is missing now is the local content on IPv6. And in some places we have seen this happening, in some places less. And uh, some of the experiment data that you showed about Zimbabwe was actually quite interesting to see that local content happening there. And, and, and that's really the, one of the key here. Uh, but the other spin I want to do <coughs> is turn this around and says, we are not yet at the point where it makes sense to put your new content only on IPv6. You still have to also provide it on IPv4. Because if you only provide it on IPv6, then you have only essentially, what, 30-something countries that can reach you. And that's not the entire internet. If you want to make sure that we have one internet and not two internet, and you provide content, you cannot do it just over IPv6. Who would like to take the second question? No? Okay. Apparently I will have to. Um, yeah, well, the, 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 A, e, the IAB uh, said that IPv6 needs to be the, the default in, 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 in the new developments. Yes, this can, have, this can have the impact, but we need to understand that the standards that are coming from the IETF need some time before they come into production and are, uh, and are implemented on the devices that we use to build the internet. So it may take some time before we can see this effect. And on the third question about, about the help desks, um, it's, a fairly, it's a very good question. Um, in the RIPE community, we, we basically wrote a couple of best current operational practices documents for the operators how to, how to implement IPv6. The first one was RIPE 554 that says uh, that is explaining how to ask for IPv6 um, uh, capabilities in ICT equipment for the procurement process. Um, the next one that where we actually, um, while talking to the wide world community uh, where they have problems with IPv6, we heard the common problem is help desk because they don't want to implement IPv6 because their help desk will just burn down in flames if they do so. So we have a document called RIPE 631, and uh, it's called the IPv6 troubleshooting for residential uh, help desks. Uh, and that is basically the description that you, you put to your help desk, and they can follow the procedure how to troubleshoot the IPv6. We also built a tool as a part of that. It's called isp.test-ipv6.com. So, if you're an ISP, if you're deploying IPv6, go and have a look at the RIPE 631, and you will find a very good solution for, for, your, for your help desk. Um, and I hope this, this um, answers the Izumi's question. Um, are there any other questions from the floor?
please, don't be shy. Yes, please, gentlemen. Yeah, uh, my name is Justin Irgundhene. Uh, I'm the, I am the director of research and innovation in um, mm -hmm. uh, the regulatory authority of uh, Rwanda. So uh, in, during this IGF, uh, I found that the government is um, uh, maybe will be a user mm. of IPv6, but also a facilitator in its uh, deployment. Uh, in the presentation, uh, which was okay. done, I found that the, the, country don't, don't, the countries does, don't have the same level of <laughs> deployment of IPv6. Uh, and I would like to know maybe which kind of uh, steps or initiatives country have can follow or put in place, uh, I mean government, to, to, to speed up the deployment of uh, IPv6. Thank you. Thank you. Would like to take a question? There are a few things governments can do. Um, I, th I think some of the easy things are putting IPv6 as a requirement in your procurement. Um, if, if the government is buying some kind of an IT service, uh, make it a requirement that the service provider must implement IPv6. Otherwise, they will not qualify to win the, the tender process or the bid. Um, Regulators could make it a requirement for licensing. Um, often the equipment needs to be approved. So, you know, if um, every cell phone has a type approval, and it could be a, a requirement for type approval that the regulator says uh, we will not approve any cell phones that don't support IPv6. Um, so just a few examples of things governments could do without passing any laws um, just using the regulatory capabilities they already have or using the financial capabilities they already have to, to decide which product or services to buy. So the couple of things uh, from uh, my point of view. Government uh, could uh, actually uh, uh, set uh, the... Um, direction uh, with uh, some time uh, uh, schedule uh, target uh, with how the country uh, like to see the adoption of IPv6 to be dealt with. In, by having such a <coughs> the nationwide uh, the direction uh, would help the uh, cross industry to be on the same page. Otherwise, you would see the different stakeholders uh, taking a different uh, uh, action uh, in terms of how to move towards IPv6 adoption. So that having a common goal uh, uh, set or published by government would uh, definitely help to bring the, all the stakeholders to be on the same page. And the other stuff, uh, as uh, I briefly touched on, the. Uh, it is uh, the also, uh, the, I think, uh, the government's role to facilitate how the different the stakeholders to meet regular basis and then exchange the <coughs> state of the IPv6 adoption uh, from the different parties. Otherwise, uh, <coughs> once again, that uh, uh, the industry has a different agenda. How actually each of the, 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 the sub-verticals of the industry has a different agenda how to actually uh, I mean, look at the IPv6 adoption. So that uh, at least the government could uh, uh, provide a platform and uh, facilitate the, the discussion uh, among uh, different stakeholders regarding IPv6 adoption. <coughs> Okay. Oh, there are more questions. Okay, we are we are out of time, but I think we can. If you are very fairly brief, please. Hi, <coughs> my name is Serge Parfait Goma. I'm from Republic of Congo. I'm from IGF Initiative in Congo. So my question goes to Mr. Alan, the CEO of Afrinic. Uh, I love the way you, the, 
the survey put things between the view of engineers and uh, managers. And what I want to know, when the engineer says that they don't have the support of the manager, which type of step they really need to deploy the IPv6? I don't know if you get my question. Okay, uh, I'm not sure. I don't think the survey asked the question in that level of detail. Um, but my interpretation is uh, when the engineer says my management doesn't support it, um, common problems would be that um, my manager gives me so much other work to do, I don't have time to work on IPv6. Um, or um, my manager will not let me hire any more staff to be trained on IPv6. Or my manager will not allow me to go on IPv6 training. So there can be many reasons that all fit into the category that the, the manager is not supporting the engineers to deploy IPv6. That's why, to earn, my advice can be for to support, to let the, the, the deploy of IPv6 going to be more efficient or more quickly. We can, the, some university can set it as a curriculum for the courses. It can be very good so that the new engineer coming or the new technical guys coming, they can be IPv6 compatible, if I can put it like that, by, by the end. Thank you very much. Okay, we started the panel a little bit late, so we can maybe finish a little bit late. Please. Actually, my, my name is Bevel Wooding. I'm the director of the Caribbean Network Operators Group, Caribnog. And it, my question actually follows very nicely on, on that comment. We have been doing IPv6 training for the better part of five years now um, in collaboration with both RIRs that function in the Caribbean, that's LACNIC and ARIN. And we still haven't seen the kind of uptick in, um, in IPv6 uh, deployment or, or engineering skill increase that we were hoping for when we, targeting, when we targeted the technical community. And so we've begun discussing um, getting into the community colleges and into universities across the region. Um, my question is, is there already available um, courses that are prepared that we can use as a starting point for outreach to the universities and the colleges? Um, is that something that has worked or uh, that is being um, explored in any other jurisdiction that you can share? Yes, um, in the case of LACNIC, uh, uh, Bebel, I think that uh, uh, you can use the IPv6 uh, basic uh, online course that uh, we have available. Uh, it's uh, free, uh, there, there is no charge. And for our uh, members, we have an advanced course that uh, is also free uh, of charge. Uh, uh, we started, uh, we, we're going to start in 2018 to keep it uh, live uh, because we used to have a, a, um, uh, editions, uh, six, uh, to uh, four to six editions a year. So in 2018, we uh, everybody could uh, just log in and, and, and start it uh, any time they, they want. So uh, it is a self uh, uh, um, uh, um, teach uh, course, so uh, you don't need no one to, to, to uh, follow up. But uh, you can use that, uh, that tool. And uh, what else? Um, we have uh, another. Um, uh, training course based on testing of applications. Uh, those are uh, free of charge to, to our, our members. So um, just let us know if uh, some of them uh, could be useful for <coughs> the community. We have a follow-up comment from Mr. Izumi Okutani. He says, I agree with the observation by Mr. Kinoshita. I think the key to success in Japan was government made sure they followed up with actual progress by stakeholders and don't stop in developing milestones. Follow up in progress gave soft pressure to players to make sure that they get their part in IPv6 deployment done and raise issues with all stakeholders in case they face challenges, which needs to be addressed by multiple stake stakeholders. Thank you. Um, I think it's time that we wrap up this panel. Maybe some quick closing words, 10 seconds each, please. We'll, should we, we can start from this side, Oscar. <laughs> uh, I don't know. 
<laughs> well, I, I, I think that uh, uh, IPv6 is not a technological issue anymore, but uh, a strategic one for the countries. So we're going to uh, keep this new approach with the, uh, the least developed countries in our region, see if, uh, if that could uh, uh, trigger some uh, deployment in our re region. Thank you. Alan. I think the key for me is to look further into the data to try to understand if there are patterns in countries that have successfully done something so that those things uh, could be used as maybe input to others. So uh, I'm going to keep working on this study. Thank you. Alan? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have any answers here. Um, I, I just recognize that we've still got a lot of work to do. Thank you. Mr. Kinoshita-san. Um, I would say that I hope that uh, there is an opportunity to update the BPF by incorporating some of the uh, best practices getting developed by the Global South uh, countries uh, because those are very much relevant for the, the, the yeah, other countries. Uh, thank you to our panelists and thank you to you, uh, good audience, for all the questions and let's, let's wrap it up. Thank you very much. <laughs>